Dr. Weiss and I spoke about how influential Dr. Schatz has been in our own um, in our own education and uh, a role model for for so many of us about the integration of serious Torah studies with serious general studies. Um, tonight, given the war, uh, we felt it was important to address an issue that's on all of our minds, and that is the problem of evil. I'm going to turn uh, the mic over to Shira Weiss, Dr. Weiss, um, to introduce Dr. Schatz and the topic, and to thank you all for coming and hope you participate in future Sachs Herrenstein events. Thank you all for coming to our second in the series of Dimensions on Jewish Ethics with Dr. David Schatz. We learned with Dr. Schatz about ethics and human decision making last week, and we will be discussing tonight one of the most challenging questions in philosophy in general and certainly in religious philosophy, and that's the problem of evil. Many, many thinkers have discussed this for uh, the history of philosophy, and it continues to be a probing question that many continue to ask. And Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, the namesake of the Sachs Herrenstein Center, has written about it as well. And in Radical Then and Radical Now, he writes, Jewish faith is not about believing the world to be other than it is. It's not about ignoring the evil, the darkness, and the pain. It's about courage, endurance, and the capacity to hold fast to ideals, even when they are ignored by others. It's the ability to see the world for what it is and yet still believe that it could be different. It's about not giving up and not letting go. But in really challenging times, like our current situation, both in Israel and for a global jury, sometimes it's difficult to maintain faith despite evil. Sometimes it's difficult to understand divine justice and how evil exists and how we can reconcile it with our religious framework. And so we call upon Dr. Schatz tonight to speak about evil, to speak about the ethics involved and how we can respond to it. Dr. Schatz. Okay, my thanks to both uh, Dr. Brown and Dr. Weiss, both of whom I am very proud to say uh, took my classes, and uh, uh, in any case, I'm, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. The, uh, the, it's eerie to discuss this topic tonight. Uh, it's eerie because philosophers distinguish between two types of evil. There's what they call moral evil, which is evil that people perpetrate on other people, and then there is natural evil, which means you know, illnesses, weather disasters, and so forth. And over the past few years, uh, you know, we've had a dose of natural evil through through COVID, uh, and we now have a huge, huge portion of uh, of moral evil, which makes it, it even more relevant. Uh, now, these categories are somewhat fluid; uh, very often they're blended, uh, natural and moral. But ultimately, there is some distinction that we're able to see. Uh, the fact that Purim is coming, I think, confuses our emotions. Uh, still more. Well, if you think you're going to come into this session at 8 p.m., uh, not knowing why there is evil in the world, and you think that at 9 p.m. you'll come out knowing it, uh, then you have another thing coming. It's not what's going to happen. What I do hope is to give you some perspectives on some of the Jewish sources. Uh, and remember, you can sometimes sort of put together this one with that one, and ultimately explaining fragments uh, of our existence, even if we don't understand everything. And I'll also take up at the end the question as to whether this whole enterprise is a reasonable and good and religiously healthy enterprise, the whole enterprise of trying to come up with reasons. Um, the series about Jewish ethics and um, the problem of evil is a problem of ethics. It's a problem about divine ethics. Think of a situation like this, a child is uh, uh, on, on the beach, wanders too far, goes into the water. Somebody is nearby, somebody who has no responsibility to the child, um, and doesn't know that the child is there. If the person doesn't know the child is there, the person doesn't come to the child's rescue. Had the person known, the person would have tried to save the child. Or think of a case where the person actually knows that the, the child is there and is in danger um, and tries to save the child, but can't because it's simply physically impossible. Now, in either case, the person would have an, what we call an excuse, meaning a good excuse, a legitimate excuse. In the case of God, God is omnipotent, all-powerful. God is omniscient. He knows everything. 
So he's not ignorant of the evils that go down on earth, and he is powerful enough to do something about them. And so the question becomes, can God ever have a sufficient justification for not solving the evils of the world? Now, maybe he does have just such a justification, and the aim of philosophers and the aim of theologians and the aim even of people who aren't particularly uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, trained in, in, in these areas nevertheless have some uh, very interesting insights into what's called theodicy. Theodicy means God's justice. I think that the, coin, that the term was coined by Leibniz. I discovered that in, listen, in watching a lecture of the Rub, where I think he said that. Um, and uh, theodicies, theodicy means a justification for evil. Like what possible justification could God have? Again, possible justifications, not that we know for sure what they are. Uh, and I have to tell you that when I first heard a long list of possible theodicies, uh, I said to myself, some theodicies are so bad that I have to wonder how a good God could allow them to be uh, suggested. But putting that aside, I want to talk about uh, some of them. First, I think it's important to recognize that there's no single problem of evil because you can pose a slew of distinct questions about evil. Question number one, why does God, who's omnipotent, omniscient, and all good, why does God allow any evil? Okay, that's sort of the, 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 the first, the first uh, question to ask. The second question, even if the first is is answered in some way would be, why does God allow so much evil? And obviously the definition of so much and too much is gonna be something which is uh, very subjective, which is a problem that Rambam talks about in, in the Moravukim, how people sort of uh, you know magnify the extent of evil in the world, and, and you can flip it around and say that they minimize it. Um, in the third question is about specific evils. When all of us has just raced your minds through Jewish history up to today, you'll find many, many cases of specific evils that you think could have been different and that God could have abolished. God could have made them not, not happen. Um, we also have to wonder things like, why does God on occasion seem to break his promises to the Jewish people? And there's a fifth question. And the fifth question is, why do the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper? Known by its uh, Hebrew, uh, its Hebrew uh, words, tzaddik v'ralo, rasha v'toblo, a righteous person for whom uh, things are, are bad, and a evil person for whom things are good. Now, I want to emphasize that that last question is not the same as the general problem of evil. I think this is a common conflation. The, the general, the, the the general problem of evil. Why is there evil? One possible answer is that all evil is deserved. All evil is some sort of a, a punishment. Uh, and um, that that uh, uh, idea that that uh, all evil is a punishment then meets with an objection. What about Sadiq Viralo Rasha Batovla? What about the righteous person who suffers and the wicked person who prospers? Um, it's so really, the the objection of Sadiq Viralo Rasha Batovla is really directed at a specific answer to the first question. Because if you answer the first question, why there's general evil, and you say it's all as a result of reward and punishment, then you've got a problem. Now, I think it's interesting that in the history of uh, philosophy, the question of why do the wicked prosper has sort of really taken a back seat to the question of why do the righteous suffer? Uh, it could be suggested, and uh, this comes out clearly in a, in a series of excellent series of lectures by Dr. Aaron Siegel, where he speaks about another form of, of, of this idea of Sadi Kerala, Russia, the Pablo, which is simply that there's a moral order in the world, which will include the righteous and the wicked. Each one should get their due. But, but overall, I think it's good at this juncture just to realize that these are separate questions. Now, given that you have five questions, I'm not going to answer five questions. Uh, what I would like to do is to give some perspectives that mostly affect the first question. Uh, and that it, it, I can't do otherwise in a single lecture because without the discussions about the first, you can't really uh, talk about the, the third. Um, I want to start now, uh, Shira, if you could put the, um, uh, the source sheet up on the screen. Okay, and maneuver it for me. I want to start with a quote from my uh, late colleague, um, Professor Yaakov Elman, uh, a, a brilliant scholar for those of you who, who knew him, um, and also for those who don't know him, I'll tell you he's a brilliant scholar. Here's what he writes in a very lengthy article about evil. He says, to our surprise, however, we find walled off areas, <laughs> not walled off, but walled off areas, where rooms opened by Chazal were left vacant with little, if any, new construction laid over the ground floor. We denizens of the upper floor 
all too often lose sight of the lowest floors. We never obtain a complete view of the ground floor at all. This is all the more so, all the more because we tend to, have been trouble reading it, to tear down the walls uh, of rooms they constructed, altering dimensions and configurations, reassigning rooms originally intended for one resident to another. In other words, there's a lot that we ignore in Chazal. Now, I don't know what specifically he had in mind in that paragraph, but if you look at the next paragraph, which I'm not going to read out loud, I'd just like you to put your eyes on it for about 15, 20 seconds, where he talks about the Babylonian Talmud. And he says the Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud, provides us with a number of, quote, mechanisms of divine governance. And then he lists a bunch of them. So just take a look. Well, I'll take uh, 15 seconds from my talking. Uh, then just take a look. We'll get a sense of what, what those are. It, so, so you see that there's an abundance. And here he's talking only about the Talmud. In later Jewish history, you have, uh, for example, Kabbalistic ideas like Sim Tzum, which means that God made room for the world. God withdrew to make room for the world, and that's used in an account of evil. Uh, or Gilgul, the reincarnation, the transmigration of souls, so that people who suffer are sometimes suffering because, um, uh, because of something they've done in a previous existence. This caused a lot of controversy when the then chief rabbi, uh, one of the chief rabbis in Israel, actually spoke about the Holocaust using reincarnation. Um, then there's the absence of good. You may have heard that. Uh, evil is just the absence of good. You may have heard the idea that evil is an illusion. I mean, you could just list on and on and on. So obviously, I'm not going to to do uh, to do all of those. But what I would like to do is to talk first about retributivist theodicy. Uh, but sure, you can scroll down one more page. Okay, the, the retributivist theodicy is the theodicy of retribution, meaning you get what you deserve. Okay, you get your just deserts. Okay, now the the, and that's why there, there is suffering in the world. The first thing, the first point I want to make is that the mere fact that there are so many other theodicies, like the ones that Dr. Elman lists, already tells you that the retributivist theodicy did not completely permeate the rabbinic thought. Now, the, but the, what I also want to do is, to, and, and one too, is to look at certain sources here. Um, this, there's a statement by Rav Ami, in uh, Masecha Shabbos 55a, Omer of Ami ain Misa lo chayt the ain Yisurin blo avon. There is no death without transgression, and there is no suffering without sin. Now that's a bold statement, but it's the most explicit, forthright statement of this theodicy that you can find of this justification of evil. That it's all about punishment. Well, an interesting thing happens at the end of that discussion, the end of that sugya. At the end of the Tal at the end, the Talmud declares, Tiyufta the Rav Ami Tiyufta, which means Rav Ami has been refuted. Now, you have to be so you might say as follows, you might say, well, one in a place where this section is stated that all suffering, all death is retribution, you might say there Gemara rejects it. You have to be somewhat careful about saying that. The reason you have to be careful is that, first of all, the refutation the Gemara gives is a refutation based on a Baraisa that simply says that there were four people who died without sin, and they died gratuitously. So is it only those four people when Ravami is rejected, or is it more? Secondly, Ravami said two things. He said, he said that in Misa B'lichet, there's no death without sin, and Yisurin below other, and there's no suffering without, without transgression. He said two things, and the example of the four people who died would only be an example that would refute the first part. And Ramban makes this distinction, and he thinks the Rav Ami, you know, was wrong and is rejected on the part about death, but not necessarily in the part about, about suffering. And also, I have to say that Rav Ami's statement appears elsewhere in Kazal, and I wrote some of the sources down there, um, where it is presented and it is not refuted. In other words, it is accepted. Still, the statement is a very stark statement, and it may very well still be that when the Gemara rejected the statement, they meant to reject as a package deal. I mean, I don't know if we know for sure that that's not the case. The second example I want to give you where a retributive theodicy is, is rejected is in a very famous source, and that's Eov. Okay? Um, in, in Eov, what happens is this. Uh, you know, Eov is suffering tremendously, and uh, he has these three friends. And with friends like that, you don't need enemies. And indeed, the friends keep telling him, listen, God is just. You, you, you must be a sinner, and that's why you're suffering. They tell him constantly, constantly, constantly that you guess, you're getting what's coming to you. 
in, in, in chapter 42, which is part of the epilogue, uh, you know, uh, scholars talk about the epilogue being tacked on, the prologue being tacked on, but I, tacked on, but I think it's possible to read the book as a coherent whole. Um, and that is that God says uh, here to um, uh, Eliphaz, Pemani, one of the friends, he says, You did not speak properly to me as Eov did. And in the next, the, the next citation I have here, he says it again, that you did not speak properly. This is what he's telling the friends. Now, the friends are the ones who said, God is just, God is just, God is just. And, and, and yet what happens? God chastises them. He's angry at them. I'm angry at you. I'm angry at you. Why is he angry? Well, I think that, first of all, they don't really understand what Eov is suffering, number one. And number two, maybe he's saying, listen, if you think that a man like Eov is someone I would consider to be not righteous enough, if that's what you think, then, you know, you're basically making me irrational, crazy. You're making my standards look absurd. So really, it's a sort of an embarrassment to God, as it were, that they are saying that God told Eov to be a, a, a bad person. So if you take these two texts together, you have, uh, these are only two, two obviously, from a, from a large iceberg, the tip of a long, large iceberg. The, um, uh, you have two points. You have, first of all, that, that Rav Ami uh, is refuted when he says, when he says, and the extent of it, you know, has to be discussed. But in Eov, I think it's pretty clear that this is a rejection of the retributivist uh, theodicy. Now, I'd be afraid to say this if not for the fact that some of the other sources coming up, but also keep in mind what I said before, that there are many theodicies, as I'll offer, that's why I had to look at the element list, uh, that many th that they offer, which they didn't have to offer if everything was retribution. Now, then we get to a source from, uh, from Maseches. I, I should mention some other difficulties here with the retributive theodicy. One is it leads to blame the victim. I mean, I don't know if you remember this, but after 9-11, uh, uh, you know, Jerry Falwell said that the reason for 9-11 was because of the licentious behavior in American society. He later had a he later had to retract that. Um, another issue that comes up, I should have mentioned this earlier, is that, you know, one of the things that bothers people about this retributive theodicy is not so much the theodicy in itself. It's this certainty with which people apply it. Remember the Versailles wedding hall collapsed some 20 years ago. And someone said it must have collapsed because there was improper dancing there. Like, you know exactly what the reason was that God had in mind. It, what's the point of saying that? Is to tell people, don't be so sympathetic to the victims. They deserved it. Uh, I mean, it doesn't, it seems to be that there's something off about thinking of everything as, uh, as punishment. There can be a lot of things that are punishment, but not literally, uh, literally everything. Uh, if you want to see a, a, a wonderful satire, on some of these extreme, you know, certainty, we know for sure that there's a an article by Rabbi Emanuel Feldman, who was uh, then editor of uh, Tradition, uh, and you can get in Tradition's archive, go to traditiononline.org, and then scroll down and look for the author, and good luck finding this particular one of the zillion contributions to Tradition. Uh, but it's wonderful. He talks about it, I think it was about uh, Hurricane Katrina, and said people, it starts off by saying, you know, people say that the uh, uh, that, that, uh, that Katrina was brought to New Orleans because of the licentiousness there. And then somebody, and that's why it was there. And then somebody says, yeah, but what about New York? New York's also, you know, very bad. And, and then the other guy says, yeah, but New York has yeshivas. And then the, you know, it, the whole thing continues. Or uh, if a bridge collapsed uh, and the second the people were hurt on the bridge, that's because they weren't building bridges to their creator. Uh, I mean, some of it is satire, some of it probably was actually said. These are problems. This, what bothers, I think, people is not the theodicy per se. It's also the way it's applied. I mean, they might it might bother them for other reasons, uh, the theodicy, but the application of it, I think, you know, has a has a negative valence for a lot of people. Okay, now let's scroll down again. Okay, back to uh, Shira. Thank you so much for helping me with this. Um, okay, uh, this the, uh, the second group that I have here, Group B. Is my sounds like a Spirit Airlines or something? A, B, C, D, Group B, modified retributivist theodicy. What I mean to say by that is that in some cases you find the retributivist theodicy, but it's mitigated somewhat. And I think that these mitigated theories run into a bit of a problem. The first mitigated theory comes from Maseches Kedushin, Rabbi Yaakov, 
where Rabbi Yaakov says, schar uh, mitzvah b'hai al malek, that there is the, the reward for a mitzvah doesn't come in this world. Okay. Uh, how does he know this? It, it comes in the next world instead. How does he know this? Well, because there are two uh, mitzvahs for which the Torah promises length of days, you know, a long life, uh, and those are honor your father and mother, and the other is shiloh hakein, kantip shiloh kantip, or you paint uh, the the um, the shiloh hakein. If you if somebody's passing by and sees eggs and wants to take the eggs, they have to send away the mother bird first. Those are the two mitzvahs for which there is long life promised. So what happens? A young lad goes up on the, on a ladder because his father told him to, to, to do this mitzvah, and he goes up and he does the mitzvah kantipar. Uh, and what happens is he he dies. He falls off. He falls off the ladder. So Rabbi Yaakov said, uh, "It can't be that the Torah is talking about this world when it talks about the rewards. It must be it's talking about the next world." Interestingly, the Gemara tries to give him a hard time, and it doesn't really succeed. Now, there's all sorts of things come to mind as to why the child might have died, and and this is not you know it, it's not where that Gemara is going. I call this modified retributivist theory because there is a retributivist part. The retributivist part is that this is all going to be straightened down in the world to come. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so that, that retributive part is there. What we're left with is a puzzle question. Well, first of all, why doesn't God give the rewards in this world? And secondly, what is the explanation of evil in this world? It, it, in other words, it doesn't really answer the question that people have about evil. It's telling you don't expect all the rewards in this world, but it's not telling you exactly why those reward, rewards are deferred. And for that, you have to look elsewhere. There's a second category that falls under this of modified, uh, a modified um, uh, retributive theory. Uh, and this is one that's associated with at least three of the we know of, uh, Ramban, Rabbein Bethaye, and um, and Avadji and and Sparno. Uh, and basically have the same issue, same or the same thought. The, the Ramban, I have to say that the Ramban, the interpretation of Ramban I'm going to give you is one that uh, it, that uh, was brought forth in an extremely, extremely important article by Dr. David Berger, uh, written in around 1981 or so, I'm not sure exactly when, uh, where he, he, he came to interpret the Ramban in a way that was very different from the way people understood it. Here was his interpretation. Uh, he said that Ramban believes that there are three categories of people. There are the Chassidim, that is the really pious ones. And then there are the Rishoyim, those at the very bottom. And then there is the Benin. The Benin, the intermediate category. Now this intermediate category, he says as follows, when it comes to the most pious people, so that those people have a very special relationship with God. And God actually exercises providence over them at every moment. Or if not every moment, then he, you know, Dr. Berger mentions it can sometimes lapse, but overall, that's really what they have. They have a direct relationship with God. The Rasham have a direct relationship, the evil doers have a direct relationship in the other direction. God makes sure that they that they suffer. The bane on him, in Dr. Berger's words, are about 99% of people. What happens to them? They are left in the Mikrei Hatvaim. It's translated usually as the accidents of nature. It means to events. I, I tried to try chance events, but it's basically nature. It's basically a subject to the vagaries, that we, I, the vagaries of nature. Sometimes nature will be good to them and sometimes bad. Uh, one, and just take a look at some of the lines here I underlined. Um, uh, uh, well, actually, let's say um, the... Uh, what am I looking for here? Oh, oh yeah, the, the, the one on 2611, uh, which is uh, the Ramban on uh, medicine. Uh, the Ramban uh, famously um, believed that ideally a person should not go to doctors. Because if you go to doctors, it signals a lack of trust in God. Um, and what he says, what, it was, we know the, 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 the view of the Rabbi Yishmael, which was quoted, which is that a, a Rofe has, Rishus has permission to, to, to heal. But there's another view there, which says that people were accustomed to, to using uh, uh, medicines, using medical treatment. Uh, and so God let them do that because that's what they wanted. But Ramban's expression here is, Hashem hinicham, it's on the, the blue, hinicham lemikrei hatvaim. He left them to the accidents, the accidents uh, of, of, of nature. 
Uh, if you scroll down a little more, Rabbeinu Bechaye, uh, and I underlined, well, actually, I didn't underline anything there, but it's the same uh, the same idea. Uh, he says, the tzaddikim shebahem, knows the hashkacha is only over the tzaddikim, shekharosh baruch hu matzilas the tzaddikim in amikrim, there's that word, shesha'or b'nei odom nimsurim the odom. Divine providence saves one from accidents, is not found in everyone, not even in just any Israelite, but only in the tzaddikim. Um, so this is here too, there is tremendous scope for natural law, tremendous scope. Uh, and uh, Dr. Berger also makes clear that the relationship, the reason the Hasidim enjoy this is not in, enjoy this kind of providence, is not because of some uh, deterministic process within the Kabbalistic metaphysics. It's because God is really exercising the providence over them. That accounts for them. But for, for most people, it's not that way. Now, there's a certain kind of, you might say, a certain kind of uh, unfairness in a way, I guess, that, that you want here. Let's say you took that group of Benjamin. And you rated one of them 300, and you rated another one 700 on the scale of Tzidkus. Now, the one that, that was rated uh, 300 may actually wind up having a much better life, materially speaking, than the one that was rated 700, because it's all based on Mikre. This is the accidents of nature. Here, too, we are not told why it's that way. In other words, you kind of feel good to realize that the tradition, many people you know, say, oh, it feels good because the tradition realizes that not everybody gets what they deserve, but it still leaves the question open, well, why don't they, you know, why don't they get what they deserve? Uh, and if you can't chalk it up to some uh, deterministic process, as I mentioned, metaphysical process, it's a hard question. It's a very hard question to answer. And that's the same question that I asked about Rabbi Yaakov's view, sort of a left with the problem of evil, even if you know that you shouldn't expect this perfect um, this perfect match of just desserts. Now I, I want to go to, I want to skip number five temporarily and go to number six. Because speaking of naturalistic uh, views and speaking of laws of nature, it's very hard to top this one. This is a Gemara in Moed Kota. And it's one of the most, if you haven't seen this Gemara, then it, it, you might have a bit of sticker shock from it. Um, Omar Rava, okay? Kaye bene umizone, meaning the length of one's life, the number of his children, the extent of his sustenance, depend not on his merit, it depends not on his merit, but on his mazal. Now, mazal means astrological influence, astrological flow. Uh, I learned that because in the old days, when you wanted to find out where, where a word appeared in Kazal, you couldn't just type in a word and then all of a sudden it would pop up on some search engine. Uh, instead, you actually had to go to Nebuch, this thing called the book. And in this book, there were names, there were words, and you, I looked up mazal to try to collect some statements by Fazal and mazal, and it said mazal si nozol. Now nozol means to flow. I don't know if it's related to English with nozol, but anyway, uh, getting getting back to this, here, so Rubba said the length of one's life, number of his children, those are three major major things in a person's life. For Rabba and Rav Chista, here's, here's his argument. His low beschus and no, it doesn't depend upon your merit. For Rabba and Rav Chista were both righteous rabbis. One would pray for rain and rain would fall, and the other would pray for rain and rain would fall. Yet Rav Chista lived 92 years, Rabbah only 40. Rav Chista's household celebrated 60 weddings. Rabbah suffered 60 bereavements. Rav Chista's household fed bread of fine flour to their dogs, and it was not needed. Rabbah's household fed bread of barley flour to people, and not enough of it to be found. Two sages of equal merit Okay, and one of them had a miserable life in material terms, and the other one had a good life in material terms. Now, th and this is all because of the operation of the mazal. Rabbah did not have a favorable mazal. It, now, the Gemara in Masecha Shabbos uh, it, it tells us that, uh, it indicates clearly that even if the mazalos are going against someone, they can override that mazal. It can be overridden. Uh, and uh, Avraham Avinu had this overridden, that's how he had a, had a child. Rabbi Akiva's daughter was almost bit by a snake, but she had done a good deed, so she so, so the uh, uh, she she was saved. Tzedakah tatzil mimoves, that the tzedakah saves you from, from death. Um, so you might say here that Rabba, you know, should have had, you might ask, well, shouldn't Rabba has had his, has, had his mazal overridden? He wasn't he righteous enough to do that. And what Tosfus basically says here, the Tosfus in Shabbos, it looks to me from the last few words, which I think are also found in Bonifat, 
quote directly, I'm not sure. About pa'amim she'ein hamazal mishtanelo. That a person who has a zechus gadol, a person who has great merit, can actually overturn the mazal, but but there are times that the mazal will not help. So in other words, this is also asserting some sort of a deterministic process that is going to lead people to that, that is going to lead people to um, uh, uh, to, to to a terrible uh, to a terrible life in, in material terms, and it's of course mysterious why that happens. Now. This is again a statement that natural law operates, and yeah, this is pretty broad. Benefe Mazone is a very, very extensive part of life, uh, and and this is though that this is what uh, uh, what Rabbi said that uh, It's it, it's remarkable, and I think you have to relate this to the Rosh Shabbos about the about the overriding uh, about the mechanism of overriding. Okay, uh, let's go back to the source book. So if I do want to go to the source pages. So now let's let's go. I said that there was one other that I was skipping. Let's go back to five. Five I, comes from what I think is the most extensive discussion of uh, suffering and evil uh, in the in, in the Gemara. Brachos heyom alaf. Im roeh adam she surin ba inolaf. If a person sees that tribulations are coming upon him, yifash peish b'masal, he must search. He must search his deeds. Um, and and if he finds, if he, let's just read the rest in the English. If he examined, did not find anything, he should attribute his afflictions to neglect of Torah study. And if he attempted to attribute his afflictions to neglect Torah study and did not find anything, in other words, he wasn't proficient in that area, it be your dua, it be your dua. No, she surim shel These are tribulations of love, as it is stated. God chastises. The one whom he loves. Now, the this is you know from a, a sort of odd notion to say to say the least. And the Gemara goes on to tell us that there were certain sages who were suffering and who just didn't want uh, either the sachar of the uh, uh, of Yisur and Shalava, and they also didn't want the didn't want the pain. But what's going on here? I mean, what, what kind of thing is this? So Rashi has a very uh, simple explanation, which is. That um, uh, th that the person is punished now for the sins sin sins in order that the reward be increased uh, in the next world. Um, Rambam doesn't like this. Rambam rejects this whole idea. He thinks it's unjust. Uh, Maharal and others talk about how 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 the suffering sort of detaches you a bit from the body. Um, it, it drains you of the physicality and you become much more spiritual. Uh, one interpretation that uh, I am sort of partial to it goes like this, and it's going to be related to some of the things that are coming up, which is that that um, it, suffering it, it can act, actually puts a person in a position where they can exercise a very important part of their spiritual capabilities, and that is faith. To continue to be devoted to God despite the suffering. Then mean that if, if God loves a person, that person is given the opportunity to then express, or bring to the full, bring to the full the potential for for devotion to God. That's similar to an interpretation often given of the Akedah that Abraham would had to go through the Akedah uh, because um, it was a way of actualizing his spiritual potential. Uh, there are issues you can, you know, raise, raise about this line of reasoning, but I think it's important to uh, to realize uh, uh, that it uh, uh, that it exists, and it may give the best interpretation. I'm not sure of uh, of the Yisur and Shalata. Let, let's go now to going back to it, uh, actually, to what I call the axiological shift. Now, the axiological axiology means the, the theory of uh, value. Uh, in other words, the idea is that sometimes when people are suffering, they can the suffering can be relieved by their their uh, by their changing their va the value system. Rav Soloveitchik loves the word axiology. In fact, I've had the amusing thought sometimes if you go to one of the elite schools and stop people randomly and ask them what's axiology, they probably will know. But if you go, let's say, to Bush, go to Shiva Haratzion, where people read the Rav all the time, they will know. Just like probably most students will not know about C.S. Lewis. Uh, who is Rav Aaron Lechlusin's Israel used to uh, quote all the time, uh, but it, but uh, with the people at the yeshiva will. The okay. So now now we get to um, 
to, I think the best way to motivate this is to talk about the, uh, the, the philosopher Epictetus, who is a Stoic. There's a lot of sort of popular literature out nowadays about Stoicism. Uh, and basically, Stoic, Stoic were Stoic. Okay, what disturbs, uh, this is one of my favorite quotations in philosophy. What disturbs people's minds is not events, it's their judgments on events. This is not what happens, it's how you perceive what happens. Uh, it's sort of your, your cognition, the way you process it. For example, uh, if you think something is fearful, it, it, I mean, if you're afraid, uh, that means it, it, that you're, you know, getting agitated. But that's because you make a judgment that something that something is dangerous. Um, if you uh, get upset about something, because you think it's intrinsically bad. Now, Epictetus carry this to extremes. I think that most of us would think are absurd. But the core idea is very important in understanding some of what happens. Look at Psalms, Psalm seventy-three twenty-eight. For anikervas uh, elohim lito, to me nearness to God is good. In other words, if you can, if if suffering, in fact, you could say, brings me closer to God, then I can handle. It. Now, this has nothing to do with how you look at other people's suffering. I think that's a problem in trying to transfer this to other people's suffering. But for one's own suffering, it's it, it's very um, uh, productive. Take a look at Rav Soloveitchik. Two quotations here. I do want to leave enough time near the end to discuss Rav Salvation and Rabbi Sachs. So let me read this a bit quickly, but they're powerful passages. The first one comes from the uh, 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 Out of the World, and there's a collection of, of, of his writings on evil. When I looked upon my grandson, now the, remember the Rav, the Rav was ill in 1959, 1960. He had cancer. And these two relate to that period. When I looked upon my grandson, I always tried to think of him as if he were my contemporary. I believe that he would always do, we would always do things and play together. Sickness initiated me into the secret of non-being. I suddenly ceased to be immortal. The night preceding my apparition, the fantastic flights of human foolishness and egocentrism were distant from me that night. However, this fall from the heights of an illusory immortality was the greatest achievement of the long hours of anxiety and uncertainty. I stopped perceiving myself in categories of eternity. When I recite my prayers, I ask God to grant me life in very modest terms. When one's perspective is shifted from the illusion of eternity to the reality of temporality, one finds peace of mind and relief from other worries. Next to the last sentence here, when one frees himself from this obsession, his perspective becomes coherent and his suffering bearable. He learns to take defeat courageously. A shift in value enabled him to tolerate suffering. He was getting something valuable out of the suffering. The next one, I think, is even more powerful. When I eulogized my uncle, Revelvel Soloveitchik, the Briska Rav, in the Auditorium of Yeshiva University, while knowing of my affliction, one nagging thought assailed my mind. All these thousands of people are healthy and expect to live a long and happy life, whereas I am not certain that I will be able to accompany my daughter to the wedding canopy. I believe that Dr. Tov Lichtenstein has been engaged to Rabbi Byron. While these thoughts are passing through one's mind with the speed of lightning, one feels forsaken, forlorn, and lonely. Gradually, this feeling of loneliness pervades one's whole being with ever-increasing predominance. The whole self becomes immersed in solitude, and the awareness of being taken away from the community, you're torn away, you're alone. Let's go to the next paragraph. The night before my operation, when my family said goodbye to me, I understood the words of the psalmist, Ti when my father and mother forsake me, this is from, of course, which is said in the high holiday season. When my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. I never understood this verse. Did a parent ever abandon his child? The parents will abandon me, God will take me up? Of course not. Yet in certain situations, one is cut off even from his parents or his beloved wife and children. Suddenly one realizes no help, which his loved ones are able to extend to him. They're onlookers who watch a drama unfolding itself with an alterable speed. They are not involved in it. And now the crucial lines, I stand before God, no one else is beside me. A lonely being, meaning the loneliest being, is a traumatic but also a great experience. This is an axiological shift. This is the way to understand what is really most valuable. Uh, the, next, the next source is uh, from the Gemara about Rabbi Akiva, where Rabbi Akiva actually you know, it, to put it another way, he sort of, as a word, maybe not the best way to put it, welcomes martyrdom in a way. 
because he is reciting the Shema as, as, he, as, as he's being tortured and it's, it's, it's Talmidim ask him, uh, you know, you're saying, you're saying the Shema, and he says, all my life, let's look at the Hebrew, the Hebrew the English here, with all your soul, it says, Bechol naf you should love God with all your soul. With all your soul, even if he takes your soul. I said to myself, when will I have the opportunity to fulfill this verse? And now that I do, should I not fulfill it? There's actually, a, 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 I could have given you a better quotation here from Yushalmi, but I, I think this one is sort of, sort of more, uh, more, more straightforward. Um, and that's, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, number 11 is simply Rambam, who took this perspective when he's discussed Eo. He said that what happened is Eo didn't realize that the ultimate, ultimate end is to, is to value God. And that the things he thought to be happiness, and I better explain to you the last sentence a bit, Look at the last two lines. Job had imagined that things thought to be happiness, such as health, wealth, and children were his ultimate goal. Now, at first, when I saw it, it seemed macabre that to think that children uh, were, uh, you know, and health were not, not significant. But the point is, the emphasis should be put on the word ultimate. They were not the ultimate goal. And that's what Job had to learn. Now, whether you find this, this shift, you know, the right shift to make or whatever, the fact of the matter is, this is the axiological shift in action, according to Rambam. Um, the next um, part, I think I'm doing okay on time now, since I'm not going, going, going through this. I hope I'm not going too fast. There's a story about a guy who took a, uh, a course in speed reading. Remember the Evelyn Wood course, as some of you uh, with, uh, took such a course. Uh, and uh, somebody asked him, how was, the, how was the speed reading course? And he said, it was great. I read War and Peace in an hour. It's about Russia. And, uh, you know, I hope you're not just, uh, you know, I hope that uh, you can look over the sheet again to see all of these coming through. The retributivism, the modified retributivism, the axiological shift. And now you have something called the soul-making theodicy. Uh, that term comes from, uh, it's been made most famous by a Christian philosopher named John Hick, who wrote a book called Evil and the God of Love. The idea behind it, it is, is simply that, um, it is simply that when you have, uh, when you have evil in the world, it makes morality possible. When there's no evil, there's no need for sympathy, because nobody needs it. There's no need for charity. And there's no need for faith, because you're not going to be in a situation where your faith will be challenged. What makes human life uh, human life is that you have to deal with challenges. You have to deal with evil. And his idea was that you can make your soul, this is soul making, you make your, to use the Hebrew word, neshama, you make your neshama, your nefesh, through, through, through activities. Now, I thought this is not, uh, just, I have a certain approach to Eov, which may be, to Job, which may be, uh, would, would tie into this. And that is, you know, Eov is a very strange book, assuming that you take it as a whole, the epilogue, the prologue, and what's in the middle, because here you have this story at the beginning of why Job is suffering. Right, he's suffering because God made a bet with the Satan. God said, uh, "Eov is so so great that Eov will, will endure whatever I give him." And the Satan said, "No, no, he's complacent. He's only he's only happy because you know he's only good because of he's he's living a good life. Um, and if you afflict him, it's going to you know it's going to affect him adversely. Uh, and what happens is really that's the bet. So what's the big mystery of the book? What's the big mystery about why he's suffering? And you have to read all the other chapters to find out why he's suffering. We know why he's suffering. It was this bad. So the way I uh, I uh, have tried to understand it, I mean, I think ultimately it's chapter 38 where God's going to overwhelm I think that that's really still the key to the book. But I think there's an interesting side light here that, that, that what happens is that God and Satan disagree about what? About the effect that suffering will have on a person. What happens when you look through the same? You find that EO grows in, in two ways. First, in the Pasuk, let's go back to the uh, uh, back to the sources. Okay, the book called Back to the Sources. Okay, um, when you go back to the sources here, uh, this is verse 425. I had heard you with my ears, but now I see you with my eyes. What that suggests is that as a result of the suffering, Eo has a much clearer perception. Previously heard about it with his eyes. Now just seeing God. He sees something he didn't see before. The exact process by which this happens, well, maybe it goes back to that chapter 38, or back to the whirlwind. But whatever it is, he winds up in the position that God had said he would wind up. That is in a stronger position. The second verse is something that Rabbi Soloveitchik uh, points to. 
uh, when he's talking about Eov, and that is that Eov grew in another way. That at the beginning, Eov cared about his family and his friends, and at the end, he has to now do things for, for, for his friends. Look what he says, Eov avdi yispaleo alechem. That Eov has to pray for those friends whom he spoke of, he spoke of earlier. There's a sub, there's a growth here. Now, I think, I would not say that, 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 that Eov is about constructing a theodicy. I don't think that that's true. I think it's a book that concentrates on the psychology of the suffering, but it's still an important question as to whether suffering can lead to religious growth and lead to moral growth. This is an example, I think, of what I call a soulmate. Uh, I mean, many philosophers who've written about evil, you know, agree, I think this is true, that there has to be some system of natural law, laws of nature. Or otherwise, how are people going to make responsible choices? Maybe that's the answer to the question I was asking earlier about, well, how do you explain why everything works according to nature? Without nature, you can't make responsible choices. It depends on a stable, natural order. And all of this ties in with this idea that if you know that stable, natural order, you'll be able to develop religiously, develop morally, and so forth. Okay, uh, so far so good, because now I'm on the part that I really want to talk about most, which is uh, which is the final part. Um, uh, and again, I can't guarantee you that at 9 o'clock you're going to walk out having the problems of the world itself. Uh, the position I'm going to describe now is a position that was taken by Rabbi Sachs and, and, and much more extensively uh, by the Rub, and it relates to something Dr. Weiss quoted at the very, at the very beginning of the session. Um, I, let me present it to you this way. Suppose you believe that a person, uh, uh, that everything that happens to a person that is bad happens because of a sin. Then you meet somebody who is suffering. Now, of course, you perceive this person as a sinner. Question, do you help this person? Well, look, if the person is going through a punishment and you're going to help him through this suffering, then that's like letting a prisoner out of jail too early. I mean, why, why should you help this person if there's a reason that he's suffering? Or take a different idea, which I haven't discussed, the idea of atonement. That that the uh, the death, let's say, of a righteous person is uh, is atonement for sins. Well, the dead too. Why should you help somebody? Why should you help somebody if they are if they are dying or if they are suffering? Why should you help them? It's clear that you should. But why? Why? After all, if you think that you if you are committed to a certain theodicy, you're committed to a certain reason why people suffer. Then, if that's the reason, then that's the reason that. That, that that should be evil. No, you have to leave the evil alone and do not. Now, this is a, a, an issue. With the, what if this comes down to is this: that I would say that within all of us, there's a tension between, on the one hand, having a theodicy, having an explanation, for evil, and on the other hand, the, the moral imperative to fight evil, to fight against evil. And I mean not just moral evils here. I mean also, you know, to to improve the, to use science and technology to improve the world and so forth. Well, now we don't know which direction science and technology are going as far as improvement. But still, this is this is what's meant here by 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 fighting the evil. So you have two opposite things going. When you have a theodicy, what's your goal? Your goal is to make your peace with evil. You, 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 you want to sort of understand the world. It's all harmonious. It all makes sense. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. Yeah, so. On the other hand, when you are a moral agent, you, you, are, you are charged with having to carry out rescues, having to help people, having to develop the world in a positive way. That's the tension. And it's captured beautifully by Rabbi Sachs and then more extensively also by, by Rabbi Soloveitchik. I, I have some reservations about this particular approach. I, I, I've written about it elsewhere. I just want to, for now, just really look at what they are saying. Okay. The, the Chief Rabbi Sachs, quoting his teacher, Rabbi Nachum Rabinovich, says that's all. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. God, he did not want to look at God. What does that mean? Why was he afraid? Now, here's Rabbi Rabinovich's explanation. Because if you were fully to understand God, he would have no choice but to be reconciled to the slavery and oppression of the world. From the vantage point of eternity, if you really understood the big, big picture, the whole picture, he would see that the bad is a necessary stage on the journey to the good. I mean, if he understood everything, he would say, oh yeah, this is going to lead to the good. He would understand God, but he would cease to be Moses. 
the fighter against injustice who intervened whenever he saw wrong being done. He was afraid, he yore, that seeing heaven would desensitize him to earth. That coming close to infinity would mean losing his humanity. If he really understood why there's evil in the world, he wouldn't fight it. Because everything would look perfect. To put this another way, if the world were perfect, it wouldn't be perfect. And Emmanuel Levinas, a uh, French Jewish philosopher, said the justification of the neighbor's suffering is the source of all immorality. When I justify my neighbor's suffering, that's because it's immorality. What does that mean? Well, because now I'm explaining that the person is, is suffering and I have a reason the person is suffering. So why should I help? That's where immorality enters. Ralph Soloveitch, I'm going to explain how he develops uh, the, the same idea. The, the, the article, this is, the, many of you know the Rav on Koldo Vido Fake, which is, uh, you know, what, what, what he wrote in connection with Zionism on the eighth, um, uh, you know, on the eighth anniversary of the birth of the state of Israel. Uh, and, and he begins by talking about evil, and he says there are two questions. The question, why? Why does this happen? And the question, what? Meaning, what, what should I do? The why, he says, is futile to answer. We can't possibly know the answer. And the what? We can answer. We can we we can we can help people. We can activate our creativity. And when we do uh, a line at the end, that summarizes that point. Um, but this is other thing he wrote, it, which was originally part of. Uh, he presented a paper at a, a conference at I think it was the Biltmore Hotel in New York. I'm not sure. The morning program was Dr. Carl Manager, a famous psychiatrist, and the afternoon was Rabbi Joseph Salvatore. At many many years later. They discovered in the Bar Ilan Library and in the Mithra Law Library also a, type, a, a, a transcript of, of, of a talk that the Rub gave in 1961. After the Rub died, he came into possession of the, of, of the manuscript of this particular talk and uh, it was converted into, uh, into an article. The title was not the Rub, the title is actually mine and Dr. Joel Walowelski's, who published this originally in the Torah Umada Journal. Uh, but uh, that's not the roast title, but I, I think it sort of captures what he's doing. Let me try to explain this quick. What the rough says is that there are two types, and, and it, it, you'll see it's very different from Koldo Tito Fe. Um, it, it, what the rough is doing here is, is saying that there are, he says there are two types of halacha. One he calls topical halacha, and the other he calls thematic halacha. Topical halacha comes from the Greek word topos, meaning surface. It's surface halacha. And the other is means root, you know, from root. The other is root halach. And, and the Rav says that these are two distinct ways of doing this. Surface halacha is halacha that, that really is um, uh, just about do's and don'ts. Whereas thematic halacha, now here I want to tell you that, it, I don't know why he used the term halacha. He's really talking about makshaba, Jewish thought. He's talking about philosophy, talking about larger ideas. But he wanted to use the term halacha for for, for the amount of halacha, for whatever reason. I'm mean, going to have some thoughts about why, but that, that's what he did. He says, let's take Shabbos. Shabbos, from a, theme, from, from a topical point of view, is a list of do's and don'ts for a 25-hour period. On the other hand, it also has a metaphysical quality, and that's the thematic halacha. So there's topical halacha, meaning what you do, and there's thematic halacha, meaning what you, uh, uh, in a way, the way you were thinking about philosophical questions. At least that's the way I'm narrowing it down at the moment. Um, and he says what happens is, in the case of thematic halacha, we have plenty of sages who try to come to terms with, with uh, evil from a thematic point of view, from a philosophical point of view. And he talks about these attempts. What's interesting is that in Koldo Di the Fake, he makes it look like he never really did this. And Ravar Lichtenstein himself has commented that the, this seems to be a bit of an overstatement of part of the rub in Koldo Di the Fake. And we did not do this sort of thing. We did not theodicize. But he says the topic of halacha can't accept that. The topic of halacha, what you should do. So let, let me read this quickly. I can't read as much as I wanted to because we're going to be uh, out of time soon. The topic of halacha could not accept the thematic metaphysic. Okay, it was, again, the view of this harmonious explanation of evil, which tends to gloss over the absurdity of evil. And it did not man engage in the building of a magnificent facade to shut out the ugly sights of an inadequate existence. The topical halacha, in other words, the imperative, the moral imperative, is an open-eyed, tough observer of things and events. And instead of engaging in speculative metaphysics, acknowledge boldly both the reality of evil 
and its irrationality, its absurdity. As a case in point, let's examine the topical halacha's attitude toward death. It's enough to glance at the laws of mourning in order to convince ourselves that the topical halacha saw death as a dreadful fiend with whom no pact may be reached, no reconciliation is possible. And the act of mourning for a deceased member of the household to hold traumatic horror in the face of an insensate and absurd experience asserts itself. Death appears in all its monstrosity and absurdity. And an encounter knocks with it knocks out the bottom of human existence. Next paragraph of the top of Halafa concurred with a the thematic in its interpretation of death as deliverance, if death is a good thing, as a victory over nihility, then why mourn and grieve for the departed? Why rend our garments, sit on the floor, and say, Borofayim Emet? Yes, the topical halacha and his its crucial distinction has evolved an ethic of suffering instead of a metaphysical suffering. Now here he acknowledges there are two strains in, 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 two strains in Jewish tradition, but something else very different from Kodot Diva Fake. In Kodot Diva Fake, the reason you should not, or one of two reasons or so that he gives, one of a couple of reasons he gives, is that there's futility. You cannot understand God's ways. That's not the factor here. The crucial emphasis here is what Rabbi Sachs emphasized. It's the disparity between having moral imperatives, having more moral responsibility on the one hand, and being able to see everything as part of this as part of this whole. Uh, personally, I think that I mentioned I had some reservations because I do think that if you take the some put in this sentence you can figure out later, but if you take the soul making theodicy, then I think it makes sense because in other words, the, the whole the whole reason for evil would then be that you have to react this way. But the rub doesn't want to do that. And the rub stops short of giving any justification. Interestingly, I don't know if the rub ever came back to this idea. Uh, I mean, maybe he flirts with it a little bit. And it's uh, meant to add to the mystery. This was published the same year that he actually wrote up Caldo Di Dofek publishing people. But be that as it may, um, it, it, I, I don't like to trivialize these by giving you examples from everyday life, but there was something that happened when I was watching a Met game, New York Mets. There was an exchange between two broadcasters. There's Ralph Kiner, Arthur Shalom, and Tim McFarver, Arthur Shalom, both of them. And, and Ralph Kiner was known for his malapropisms. He didn't always you know, say exactly the right thing. I you know, remember there was a Mother's Day where he said, to all your mothers out there, happy birthday, or something like that. And he and Tim McCarver were talking, and uh, Ralph Kiner, you know, Tim McCarver said, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. And Ralph Kiner said, how are you celebrating Mother's Day? And Tim McCarver said, well, my mother is looking on some, a better place. And Ralph Kiner said, glad to hear that, Tim. In other words, he didn't quite get the point. But the, philosophically, the question is, if she's looking on a better place, if she's in heaven, then, then indeed, you should be glad to hear that. So it's this idea that it all makes sense. You know, it's, it's, it's just wonderful. He's in a better place now. But that doesn't, you know, that, that's not really the way you should react. Um, so um, let me just go now to the, to the very end of this, if I can just hold two, two three minutes more. Uh, Rabbi Sachs, the quotation number 16, is very much like uh, what Dr. Weiss put before. Judaism is not faith as illusion. Seeing the world through rose-tinted glasses, we wish it to be. It is faith as relentless honesty, seeing evil, as fight and fighting in the name of life and good and God. And that would be the topic of halach. Uh, he doesn't relate it to the rough, but the same idea. And this quotation from Salvechik, which captures his idea, man is born like an object, it is from total the fake, dies like an object, it possesses the ability to live like a subject, like a creator, an innovator, who can impress his own individual seal upon his life and can extricate himself from a mechanical type of existence and enter into creative, active mode of being. He has in mind here moral activity and predictable. Man's task in the world, according to Judaism, is to transform faith into destiny, a passive existence into an active existence, an existence of compulsion, perplexity, and muteness into an existence replete with powerful will, resourcefulness, daring, and imagination, and very much had in mind, had in mind the moral. Uh, one of the thought that is the Ram, that the Rose had when he wrote the letter to Dr. Dan Vogel I don't know if I mentioned this already. It was Dean of Stern College and talked about and, and he talked about a lecture. That's where he, he didn't mention the one from 1961 and sort of reiterated called the effect. But there's an interesting idea that Ruff has here, which I've always thought is important to explore, which is the idea that there's a kind of law of baltashis with regard to human experiences. Uh, baltashis means, you know, don't waste anything, just like you can't waste food. You can't waste your experiences. And it's always important to try to find something to do with your experiences something of a creative nature, something that can bring you closer to God, something that can bring you to closer, closer to 
uh, to, 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 moral, to moral activity. And now just the last quote comes from Viktor Frankl, who some of you heard of the, of the logo therapy school, man's search for meaning. And I think this very much is in line with the right. Life is never made unbearable by circumstance, but only by lack of meaning and purpose. And I guess, let me end there. Thank you very much. No, I can't hear you, Shira. Thank you, you so much, Dr. Schatz. We look forward to seeing everybody next week for our third in this series. We'll be looking at the ethics of altruism and the topic of sacrificing oneself for others. Thank you again for joining tonight and we'll see you next week.